Hi, I'm Len Epp from Lean Pub, and in this episode of the Front Matter Podcast, I'll be interviewing Matt Provost. Based in London, Matt is an IT professional and public speaker with over two decades of experience working for a number of companies around the world, including for Weta Digital, Yelp, and Lyft, and he currently works for Woven Planet, a self-driving technology company. You can follow him on Twitter at HyperSuperMeta, and check out his website at rftgu.rs. Matt is the author of the in-progress book, Rust from the Ground Up. Real World CLI Programming in Rust. In the book, Matt uses a practical approach to introduce readers to the Rust programming language, which has a notoriously steep learning curve, showing readers how to build powerful applications and develop intuition and confidence in Rust programming. In this interview, we're going to talk about Matt's background and career, professional interests, his book, and at the end, we'll talk a little bit about his experience writing and self-publishing. So thank you very much, Matt, for being on the Lean Pub Front Matter podcast. Thanks. It's great to be here. I always like to start these interviews by asking people for their origin story. Um, So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about where you grew up and how you found your way into your career in technology. Yeah, yeah, happy to. Um, So I grew up in Connecticut in New England. Uh, And of course, I've kind of come full circle and live in old England now in London uh, with a lot of stops uh, along the way. So I went to Indiana University uh, for my undergrad uh, and majored in history and art history. So nothing to do with computers, uh, but I grew up surrounded by computers. Um, my dad was was sort of one of the first crop of computer science uh, people going through a program in the in the seventies, and so we grew up with like a TRS eighty and a color computer, and then graduated to a IBM XT clone and all that kind of stuff. So always had computers in the house ever since I was a, a little kid. Um, my dad was actually publishing computer games when I was growing up for the color computer oh, wow. um, that he used to do in his spare time. Um, so yeah, kind of surrounded by it. I tried to get away from it a little bit in college, but it, it sort of dragged me back in. Um, and yeah, so I ended up in Los Angeles for the sort of first dot-com boom in 2000. Um, I think I actually moved to LA the week of the stock market crash, um, for the for the first crash there in 2000 um but you know i made my way around and had a had a series of jobs in system administration doing a lot of like solaris and all that kind of stuff some networking things like that Uh, and eventually in 2005 i emigrated to new zealand uh, without much of a plan um but moved to uh, christchurch where i uh, met my wife uh, and then ended up uh, through some contacts, uh, getting to know some people at Weta Digital, which is for Peter Jackson's VFX studio. So the people that did Lord of the Rings and, and all of that. And uh, finding good tech people in a small country like New Zealand is a challenge. So they were always kind of looking out for, for people with any kind of experience. And so I talked to them and uh, they, uh, they had some top secret project that they couldn't really tell me about. Um, but that they needed help on. So I moved to Wellington to do that. That turned out to be Avatar. And so I spent the next couple of years working behind the scenes on all the uh, infrastructure to render Avatar, which was, you know, uh, a ton of work and 3D and and all that. We won the Oscar for that. That was pretty fun. Uh, And I stuck around in that industry all the way through uh, the first two Hobbit movies. So made a bunch of movies in in the middle I did the first two Hobbit movies and then got really burnt out before the third one. And so I said, I don't know, <laughs> I don't have it in me to do, to do one more. Um, so uh, we decided to, to see the world and kind of do a bit of travel and stuff. So I moved to London um, with one of the companies that we'd been working with in the, in the sort of VFX uh, infrastructure uh, space and worked for them for a couple of years uh, before going to Yelp where I decided to get back into engineering management, um, take a little bit less of a technical role and more of a, more of a sort of people role, uh, and then moved over to, uh, to Lyft. They had a um, part of their level five self-driving division was in London and they needed an engineering manager to run the, the London office. So how could I say no to getting involved in self-driving? So I, uh, I took that. Uh, and then I guess a little less than a year ago, uh, we were acquired by Woven Planet, which is a division of Toyota, which is the world's largest car company. So that's what we're working on now. So I always tell people, I mean, if you tried to like, you know, if I tried to plan out my career, I mean, there's just no way that it would 
sort of all fit together, but it's just one of those things of one thing leads to another and a conversation with someone leads to another conversation. And so it's sort of organically grown in a really interesting direction. Thanks very much for sharing that really great on very brief synopsis of, of so many different things and so many different different paths you've gone down. Um, one thing I wanted to sort of sort of start start at the the beginning, I guess. Um, so you were studying art and art history in, in Indiana, I believe, just looking at LinkedIn here, and you made your way to LA. How did you get a job like in in IT without having a formal background in it? At the yeah. Time? And as you mentioned, it was a yeah. specific kind of time. There was a big dot com boom going on. That's exactly it. I mean, I just timed it right. It was kind of all hands on deck. So, you know, I, I had a real, you know, background in tech. I was working in the computer lab at school as like a part-time job. You know, they would have people kind of around the around the lab. Um, I'd been doing that kind of throughout my throughout my studies. Um, so I kind of kept kept uh, you know a bit of interest there. And I think to, right right towards the end of my college career, I kind of realized that. Uh, I didn't want to go to grad school for archaeology or something like that. Um, there was just kind of no career there. So um, I think my last year of school, I did some sort of intro to computer science courses and kind of picked up enough of the basics um, that, yeah, I managed to sort of talk myself into a, into a sort of uh, kind of smaller job. And then, uh, yeah, just uh, they were, I think, looking for anybody that knew anything uh, kind of about anything to to get involved at that point in time, and so I just timed it right. Well, and it's it's so interesting when you say when you say they they were looking. That includes uh, Warner Brothers was was looking for people. Is that is that right? There's this really interest, fascinating detail on 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 your profile where um, you were sitting on top of like I think hundreds of Warner Brothers websites at a certain point. Um, yeah, that's right. Including the and so sort of. To, I think this this might be one of the podcasts where people will know exactly what I'm talking about. But you were actually sitting on top of the Space Jam website, <laughs> which which is you know a part of web history. Yeah, that's right. I I leave that on my LinkedIn as like a, kind of an Easter egg um, to see if any interviewers ever ask me about it, and almost <laughs> nobody does. So well done, well done for finding it. Um, but yeah, yeah, I ended up as uh, as one of the webmasters at Warner Brothers, which at the time was part of AOL, but was all running on these big, big iron Solaris machines, um, which is what I sort of specialized in. It's hard to imagine now, but there there was a time when Linux was really a toy, um, and you know, at, you know, the first dot com boom was all pretty much built on on Sun Solaris, and so that's that's what I was sort of specialized in at the time, and. Um, yeah, ended up going to to Warner Brothers, and yeah, they just you know every time a movie came out, they would hand us another website to run, and uh, so Space Jam was was one of those, but um, probably the most interesting one was uh, Harry Potter. So I was webmaster of the HarryPotter.com website dirt when the first movie came out, and um, so it was actually the busiest site on the internet for like a month. Um, because every kid in the world was going to harrypotter.com and we had all kinds of games and different, you know, videos and stuff for the, for the premiere. And so trying to, that was kind of my introduction to, to scale and trying to keep up with demand and everything else, which really helped me later on when I was doing things like movies, which is all about scale. I was going to say, so that's, that's a super fascinating sort of entryway into it. I mean, this was, this was in a sense, like compared to now, kind of like, I, it's a very American kind of metaphor, but it was very cowboy days, you know, um, where, you know, you could, if you, if you were the, a guy who could run a website, you know, you could, there were people desperate, desperate to have you running their website and running a website back then meant something very different from running a website now. Uh, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit what you did as a sort of webmaster back then. What was your, was your job to like watch traffic and make sure there were enough servers available to, to meet the traffic and things like that? Yeah. Yeah. Um... Yeah, it's exactly right. It was it was very hands on <laughs> back then. I mean, all the way from uh, you know the the hardware level, right? Like buying servers and taking them off pallets and racking them up and you know plugging them in and and you know uh, you know building the network and all of that. I mean, it was it was we weren't that specialized, so everybody you know just kind of had to had to do everything. But then you were you know hand compiling an Apache server 
with the options that you needed and everything and, and getting that to run uh, and then getting, getting the content from everybody else, putting it there. Um, a lot of the stuff we were doing back then was uh, Java. Java was kind of the, the hot new thing. Um, and there used to be a real divide. This was like long before DevOps. So there really was like a wall in between the developers and the system administrators where like none of the system administrators knew anything about Java. Um, and they were just sort of handed these <laughs> files and said, here, run this on your servers. And you were like, oh, okay. Um, but I actually spent a lot of time uh, tuning the JVM. I mean, it's sort of all taken care of now from what I understand. But back then, and there was a lot of like manual tuning, you know, watching the memory consumption, watching the CPU consumption, tweaking some parameter somewhere and seeing how things went and there were no guidebooks, you know, I mean, I was working my first job in 2000 when Google kind of came on the scene. And before that, it was like Alta Vista and, and things like that. So there's definitely no stack overflow, you know, kind of open source things to look up. So, you know, when something went wrong, you were really kind of on your own trying to figure it out as best you could. And um, was it uh, books that you would turn to books and colleagues, basically, that you would turn to when you encountered a new challenge? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I sort of grew up having these big, you know, fat O'Reilly books all around my desk um, that you were, you know, sort of frantically flipping through and studying on weekends and, uh, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And then, yeah, like you just, you know, through your through your network, I mean, you'd sort of work with people that have been around longer than you and had maybe seen something. And there was a lot of kind of tribal knowledge. You know, somebody had worked at some place and, sort of knew some secret uh, way to squeeze some performance out of something. And um, yeah, you sort of had to build up your connections to find all that stuff out. You mentioned um, watching and that, that reminded me I had around, around that time, around 2001 or so, I had a friend uh, in London who, who got a sysadmin job and uh, he had, he quickly developed a kind of thousand yard stare because he was on call all, all the time. And so at least that's how that's how I kind of saw it. Like something changed in him. Like it was very intense. Um, like at any moment, something could happen. And he had a, one of the old timey pagers, and he could get a ping on his pager, and off he had to go to maybe deal with something really serious, or maybe it was a false alarm or something like that. Was that the kind of work that that you were doing? Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. I mean, at, at Warner Brothers, we had those original kind of first generation BlackBerry pagers. Before they had phones, it was just like a, a pager with like. I forgot three or five lines or something of text and a little thumb wheel and the, the sort of classic BlackBerry keyboard. Um, and that was pretty high tech. I mean, for back then to get like over the air, you know, alerts and emails and everything else, but that's how we, that's how we sort of watched the website. But yeah, you, I mean, you were on call 24 hours a day. Um, I can definitely remember it was for a, a different company, a web hosting company, but for our, uh, company Christmas party, we went to Universal Studios and we were on one of the rides. I think it was the, I think there was like a Jaws ride where you're in like a little boat, you know, that's on these little kind of train tracks that goes through. And, you know, I got paged uh, in the middle of the ride and I was sitting there with the CTO and it's like, what do we do? And he just opened the door to the boat in the middle of the ride and all the lights came up and alarms went off everywhere and the, the ride completely stopped for everybody on it for like safety. And we just ran out of the ride down some like uh, little corridor that they had for staff only and ran away and had to go uh, deal with the website. Oh my goodness. <laughs> That's intense. Um, thank goodness you weren't, you weren't out in the middle of the water with even a, a robotic shark who knows what might happen. Um, uh, yeah. But yeah, that's, that's really intense. Um, my next question is a version of a question that I, that I often gets asked on this podcast, which is um, if you knew when you were in college, what kind of a career you were going to have, do you wish you'd studied computer science? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. I haven't thought too much about it. I mean, I've been pretty happy with the way things have gone. And I kind of wonder if I had studied more computer science, I probably would have gone down more of like a programming route. So, and I was, you know, I really enjoyed my career, you know, doing system administration and it tended to attract this kind of, you know, different group of people 
who hadn't like exactly studied computer science, but were interested in computers and had, you know, figured a whole bunch of stuff out. I think if, if I had really studied computer science, I probably would have been a programmer, which also would have been fine. I'm sure, you know, I, I would have done okay, but um, it would have been a really different experience. And I really enjoyed my time doing, doing system administration. But it's one of those things of you, you sort of ask people, like, how did you become a sysadmin? And everybody's got some crazy story because there's no kind of traditional route to do it. There's no course you can study, you know, at, at a university or anything. Uh, there's no sort of traditional way of doing it. People kind of fall into it. And I'm one of those. So, yeah, no regrets, I guess. Yeah, there's um, a podcast interview I did a couple of years ago with someone named Dave Kawula, uh, who was from Saskatchewan, the province in Canada where I'm from. And he and his teenage brother were in this town called Prince Albert. And somehow their parents learned there was a contract out to basically hook up some computers in uh, for the like local city hall or something like that. I'm going to I'm getting it wrong, but it was something like that. And they were basically the only two kids in town willing to hook things up. So that's how they got their first contract. And they ended up in a, in a sysadmin style careers to this day. Um, so it's just, it's just fascinating to hear, you know, that, that, you know, I, I've never heard before that that's actually kind of like the, the particular instance is unusual, but that it's unusual is not unusual, you know, that someone's origin was, yeah. was, was, was like that. Um, and so, uh, and so you, you, uh, as you said, you, 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 you know, you bounced around a few places and you decided to move to New Zealand. Um, and you said without, without much of a plan, uh, what, what prompted that? Yeah, it's, it's funny. I, I talk about this sometimes. I, you know, the, the exact motivations are kind of lost in my own history. I don't really remember. It wasn't very well thought out. I think part of it was, I think there was a buzz in LA. Um, it was, it, this was, you know, in the time of the, uh, the Lord of the Rings movies and everything. And I think a lot of the crew from LA that had gone down to do it had sort of come back. So I think I ended up at some parties or something where people were like, oh, I just spent a year in New Zealand. It was amazing or something. And it was one of these things where I thought, hey, I wonder if I could go to New Zealand. And I went online and applied for a visa and got accepted. And I was like, oh, right. Okay, I guess I'm going to New Zealand. And then there was a lot of paperwork after that. It took probably about a year to get everything straight to kind of move down. But the initial decision was like over about the course of a week, I think. So yeah, and then I didn't have a job. I just sort of packed everything onto a plane and, and moved down and found something to do. Uh, I'm just curious, did you have something like a working holiday maker style visa or something like that? Um, I'm not sure if they still have it. Um, it was maybe similar to that, but it was basically a path to permanent residency. So oh. they have a point system. You hear a lot about this like Australian style point system. New Zealand has a, has a similar thing. Um, and they have a skill shortage list, which when you look at it is really funny because it, there are things it's like doctors, dentists, um, you know, civil engineers, all this, stuff. but it's also like dairy workers and plumbers and construction drivers. And, <laughs> you know, so, so different industries in New Zealand can apply to the government and say, you know, there are, isn't enough, you know, local market to, to hire from, you know, can we, you know, get some, get some visas for, to hire people from overseas but it doesn't necessarily connect you directly with an employer. It's just like in the industry and technology, you know, whatever computer programming or system administration, I can't remember how specific it was. It may have just been IT in general. It was definitely on the list. Film is kind of perpetually on the list. So if you do anything related to movies, you can always kind of get a, a visa to go down there. But um, at the time I wasn't in that industry. I was just, you know, a sysadmin. So I applied under that and, I think the rules are once you get there, you have to stay for two years. And if you stay for two years, then you can apply for permanent residency. So I did that. And then I think after six or seven years, you can apply for citizenship, which I did as well. And um, so you've been there for a while and then you uh, got linked up with a meeting at, at Weta for a, a secret project uh, that, as you mentioned, turned out to be to be Avatar, which I think, I mean, you know, people, people listening who don't know, I mean, Avatar was I think as I understand it a project that was deliberately set out on James Cameron's part to innovate on technology and uh, that must have been really fascinating I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about you know what what that what that involved I mean I, I watched a talk that on YouTube that you gave a few, like I mean this has been six or seven years ago or something like that but you talked about basically sitting on top of the biggest collection of supercomputers in the southern hemisphere or something like that 
at one point, maybe not, maybe not for Avatar, but at, at Weta. So, I mean, can you just talk a little bit about what your particular role was in, in developing that movie? Yeah, no, lots, uh, lots of good stories about that. Um, and yeah, that the supercomputer definitely was for Avatar. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get there, but yeah, so I, I went down and they were, uh, Working on the movie, there were, you know, some early sort of shots being worked on and, and stuff like that, but just beginning to sort of ramp up the, the infrastructure. And the way it kind of works in the movie industry often is you, you kind of, you know, you, you start off using the last movie's hardware. So they had all these servers and everything that they'd used for King Kong which had been Peter Jackson's kind of previous movie that had come out a couple of years ago. And so they had all these servers sitting around and, and they were doing that, but they knew that Avatar was going to be this sort of game changing thing. So they were in the process of building a, a kind of purpose built water cooled data center on some industrial land near the airport. Um, and so that was under construction uh, when I started. And then we just started ordering equipment um, Kind of you know every couple of months you know more more pallets would show up and uh, I was I was the sort of new guy on the team so I got stuck uh, kind of unboxing and racking up all these all these servers so I ended up uh, yeah racking up I think almost every server that we bought um, for for Avatar and eventually we uh, opened up the the data center you know probably a year or so before the before the movie premiered. And commission that and so I was involved kind of you know in, in all the different parts of it the you know there was a, a systems team it was a really small team um, for the amount of work that got done I mean it was really incredible how productive everybody was I think there were like seven or eight of us or something like that which you know sometimes we would sit it, it's kind of like an open book in the movie industry because the credits are there at the end of every movie so sometimes we you know you could go and you'd watch like a Pixar movie or something and it would get to the systems team and it would have like 30 people. And we were like, what are they like? Why do they have 30 people? <laughs> there are only eight of us. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so you can kind of see what everybody else in the, in the industry is doing. Um, but yeah, like there, you know, there, there were sort of some people that were more into the networking side, some people that were more into the Linux side, uh, some people that were more into the storage side, like network storage uh, was a huge, huge thing. Um, and some people that were, were more into the sort of HPC compute side. Um, but yeah, so, um, so I got to, to build that, that data center, commission the network. I think I ended up sort of falling more on the network and storage side um, eventually. So I uh, worked on that, built that. And yeah, we ended up having um, basically the biggest supercomputer in the, in the Southern hemisphere. Um, to do avatar and there's a like twice a year they there's some industry body i forget um but they published like this top 500 supercomputer list which companies and institutions are always you know trying to get onto and everything else and to get an official result you have to run this benchmark called linpack where usually the vendor does it. So like IBM or HP or something like we were uh, using HP computers at the time. Um, but usually the vendor organizes it as this kind of commissioning exercise. So they go onto the campus or wherever and they install this huge supercomputer with usually some government grant or something like that. And then to sort of commission that they run this benchmark, which takes like a week to run. And then you get some number out of it. Uh, and then that, you know, you submit that to this body and then they sort it and put it, put you on the, on the top 500 list. Uh, and in fact, that number is often written into commercial contracts. So you'll often sign a contract like you, you know, we want IBM to build us a supercomputer that can benchmark at, you know, at this, at this number or something. The problem is we never had a week where we could run a benchmark. The, you know, the computers were rendering avatar 24 seven like even you know five minutes of downtime was a huge deal, um, so we just never had time to do it. So basically, what we did was as we would, we we could bring on like maybe a rack of servers um, and run the benchmark, or HP would run the benchmark across that rack, um, and then we'd get that sort of certified as as a supercomputer. So in the end, we had seven. On if you look at the the old list from that time, we had seven supercomputers on the top. 500 list all in the top 
like around the 100 mark, but you'll just see like, you know, 101, 102, 103, 104 is like all these wetted digital supercomputers. So I think if we had run the, ben we estimated, I think if we had run the benchmark on the entire data center all at once, it would have been top 25. So yeah, no, that's a pretty that's, big deal. That's super interesting. I'm going to try and ask uh, if I can sort of interesting questions about it. But um, one, one thing that's really interesting detail in there is that the, that it's one data center, but it's multiple supercomputers kind of arbitrarily determined by which racks you ran the tests on? Yeah, it was, it was basically just as we would get them shipped in. So the movie as an industry is also always trying to spend like the least amount of money that they can. So they would buy you a certain amount of computers and you would do some of the movie and then you know, everybody would be looking at the charts and the graphs and seeing how much work we had to do and everything else. And everybody would sort of sit there and say, well, we're not going to get it done with this. Can we have another $5 million to, to go buy another rack of servers? And I said, all right, all right. Um, and so we'd buy another rack and commission it and add the, you know, and benchmark it and then add it into the system. And then that might last a few months. And then we all look at the graphs again and say, we're still not going to get it done. I mean, it was, it was, yeah, for some of these movies, especially for like the Hobbit movies, I can definitely remember we were adding millions and millions of dollars of equipment in the last weeks of the movie, um, running it hard for like two weeks, and then we turned it off for months when once the you know once the movie was finished rendering. But we wouldn't have finished the movie without it. So at some point they were like, well, we have to spend a couple of million to buy more, you know, whatever you know cores just to get the movie done, even though there's only a week left, so. Yeah, that's that's just so interesting to me. Um, the, uh, it, I'm reminded of a, a friend who was um, working on a PhD on um, engin an engineering degree, and his research got postponed because he lost supercomputer time that right. like, took him months to get back. And so this, when you're talking about like, running 24 seven, there, there, I mean, I imagine there must've been like, were you ever on the receiving end of like the, I don't know, like the spaceship team needs time but we've already allocated it to the living tree in the forest team. So screw you, you're, you're, you know, you're later in the schedule or something like that. Would you, would you, would that be the kind of thing you'd have to confront or would someone else make those decisions before they came down yeah, to allocating things? Luckily not. There was an entire, there was an entire team dedicated to that called the data wranglers. Um, and that was basically their job. They were uh, like, we were running 24 seven and we were on call 24 seven, but we kind of worked, we were working 10 hour shifts actually during, during Avatar, but they had a 24 seven rotation. So they had staff there all the time to keep the renders going and they had to balance all of those things. They'd have the calls from their producers saying, Hey, we've got a trailer to get out, drop everything. We need, you know, this, this, and this in the trailer, you know, get those, get those done as a priority. So they'd evict somebody else's stuff and then get an angry phone call from somebody else. But thank God I didn't have to deal with, I, uh, yeah, we had a whole team kind of buffering us from the uh, from the end users. They did a great job. It's um it's really interesting. When I was doing research for this uh, interview, I, I I learned a little bit from uh, I think a paper you wrote about how um, you're managing you're managing a large installation, you know, a, a big data center, things like that. But it's also people, right? And when when the computer's got a problem, it goes, "Hey, people, I need your help." Um, and managing that process itself uh, can be very kind of up to you, which is yeah. something, I th something I think that's sort of like, you know, for people on the outside, like me, we think, oh, it's really, it must be really technical. It must be very kind of like, you know, specified and stuff like that. But a lot of managing those systems is, is managing teams of people and trying to do things like prevent burnout and things like that, because the, the machine might burn out, but, but if the person you need to fix it is burned out, that machine's going to stay burned out. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's, that's exactly right. Um, and, you know, the, the company and the industry was sort of going through a, a, a bit of a shift um, as well. So, you know, historically, like in the beginning, you know, the, the company was basically set up by Peter Jackson to make his movies. And it really kind of came into its own, of course, during Lord of the Rings. And so, you know, I was working with a lot of people that had been there, you know, during that time. And you, you would sort of talk to everybody and they would work on a movie for like a year because the movies came out kind of one, two, three. Um, 
And then, you know, you'd have the premiere in December and everybody would get to see the movie and you'd have this big celebration. And then everybody would like go to the beach or something like that for like months and kind of recover. <laughs> and then they'd sort of trickle back in, and, you know, the next year and kind of get ready and, and finish, you know, the next movie. And so there was sort of a pace to it. Um, but the way, it, the way it works these days, I mean, I think across the industry, there's just so much money involved. Um, that it's just this machine and you're just cranking out movies, you know, 12 months out of the year. Um, so you never have that downtime. There's just, you know, there's too much money and resource, you know, kind of being wasted if you're just letting all the computers and everything sit there. So you go find like, oh, we can sign up to do 15 minutes of this Marvel movie or something like that in the, in the gap in between the big movies. And so things like burnout become, you know, a real issue because you just, you, you never have that, you never have that downtime. So we used to, you know, on the system side of things, we used to do things like kind of in between the movies, you could sort of tear down all the garbage that you had put in to keep things running. You know, there was this sort of virtual duct tape kind of all over the place, sometimes literal duct tape, sometimes just horrible old hardware that we had to get out of storage and plug back in just to keep things running or just to get us over the over the last little bit. And then once the movie was out the door, you could kind of, okay, let's shut everything down. Let's recommission everything and do it properly and kind of reboot, you know, upgrade the OS. You know, a lot of things just got put on hold, you know, even if, you know, critical patches or something were coming out like a week before the movie was done, there was no way you were going <laughs> to shut things down to, to do that. Um, but over time, it became this operation of like, right after that movie was another movie. And so you never had the time to sort of go back and do things and everything just piled up. So yeah, managing burnout was, was, a was a really big thing. I actually, uh, uh, so just, you know, that kind of highlights a little bit like my transition, mm. you know, into management happened, uh, happened around then. So on Avatar, I was, you know, working on the team and building networks and racking servers and, all that kind of stuff. And after Avatar, the manager of the systems team left, um, I mean, I think from burnout um, and I got handed the, the role. Um, so I was sort of thrown in the deep end, a little bit of, of management without much mentorship or anything. And uh, so I kind of took that over. But in the end, I think the manager spent like the next three years in Thailand or something like on a beach kind of doing yoga and stuff to sort of get his get his head straight which maybe if I would have known how stressful it was going to be I wouldn't have signed up but at the time uh, I had no idea yeah just just um we're not going to talk about this forever but I mean of course we could uh, but um <laughs> but uh, I wanted to actually dive into a, a very specific detail there so you had a you had a system called Nagios I think it was called um that you yeah used. that's right and this, uh, there's a there's a talk I'll, I'll I think I mentioned already, but I'll, I'll link to it in the transcript for this uh, interview um, where you talk about this. But it's it was really interesting to me to hear about the dynamics of it. For example, I gather one detail is that uh, someone would be typically on call for a week at a time, and that meant that you could be woken up in the middle of the night by I mean it probably wasn't a pager by this point, but some something would something would go off and you'd have to check and see, and then you still had to make a judgment call like is this a false positive, is this really serious. Is there something that's going to take care of this anyway? And, you know, did someone else also get notified about this? Because they said it to, they said it so that they would personally be alerted because it's the part of the system that they know best and they want to be taking care of it. But also I gather that people were, if someone was being paid by the hour, if they got woken up by, an, if they got alerted, they got paid for an hour. So they kind of had this sort of murky incentives to sort of add alerts to the system. And this just, it, I, I don't think you ever described it as becoming a tangled mess, but it became a problem that you had to deal with that this things were sort of a little overly arbitrary. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, you know, I, I think there's a paper that you published at, at a conference or something like that, but about how you, you finally sort of jumped on the problem and, and tried to tackle it. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny that you found that old paper. Good. Um, yeah. Nagios was kind of the industry standard open source kind of monitoring system. So you would put all these rules in and say, you know, if you see this happen or if this system goes offline, you know, page this person. And so, yeah, we used to take it in turns to, to do that. But it was pretty brutal. I mean, especially when things were really busy. I mean, you would get woken up every night um, while, you know, while, while you were on call. Um, and I think with any of those systems and, and, you know, you see that, I think with, with any, you know, it, the tool wasn't the problem. It was, you know, the system, but um, 
over time you're 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 just constantly adding like well we never thought it could fail in that way before but it does so then you you know you add an alert for it and you know the number of alerts just kind of keeps increasing because you just keep catching you know more and more things and so more and more things are you know just sitting there waiting to waiting to wake you up um, and it is always that balance between you know you go back to work the next day and you're like oh do I really try to fix this thing which you know it could take a week to do or do I just hope that it doesn't happen again for a while you know I sort of patched it up and, and kind of moved on and you know and then the busier you get the the less sort of free moments you have to actually fix anything and the more sort of duct tape you get out and the and the worse it gets um, but yeah I mean burnout is a really common problem I mean it's still you know across the industry but especially for uh, you know, system administrators, you know, we had the same thing at Yelp just a few years ago, you know, different, different story, but um, still the, the same kind of thing. Um, I mean, it's still sometimes kind of amazing that you see these really, really big, you know, websites um, where, you know, sometimes you hear about the consequences, like, wow, if this thing goes down and it costs us like millions of dollars. Um, and they're still being run kind of by skeleton crews sometimes and often crews that aren't kind of 24 or seven. Um, I mean, I can remember back in the first dot-com boom back in 2000, I was at the company X drive and we had a 24 seven knock. So we had like a network operations center. So we had humans sitting there 24 hours a day, just in shifts. And we would hire, you know, young people straight out of school or people, you know, without a degree or something. And they would just sit there and watch things and they would call somebody else if there was a problem or something and they needed to escalate, but we sort of had people there and it feels like nobody kind of does it anymore. You're just, you know, you're just relying on people to sacrifice their weekends and nights to sort of keep these, these websites just up and running. Yeah. It's interesting. You mentioned that. I think it wasn't, it wasn't too long ago that there was, I think a big Facebook outage or something like that. And it wasn't like this, but it was the kind of technical equivalent of someone tripped over a cord or something like that. And, you know, people were very surprised that you'd think there, there's still these kind of kludgy vulnerabilities built into even the sort of biggest and most famous websites. Just moving on a little bit. Uh, so you, you, uh, so you had these uh, very intense and I imagine wonderful years in New Zealand, but you eventually decided to uh, move to London. I'm curious, uh, having moved to London myself a couple of times, uh, what what neighborhood did you choose to move to when you first moved there? Wow, I know. Um, it's so controversial when you move here, which part of London do you, you move to? And I was just telling somebody this the other day that you know, we asked everybody we, we knew that I lived in London because a lot of Kiwis sort of do a tour of duty in in London at some point. They call it like the OE, the overseas experience. So usually they take a gap in between like university and their first job in New Zealand or something and go to go to London for a couple of years. But honestly, you would ask 20 people like, what part of London is the best part to live in? And you would just get 20 different answers. There was you know, never, we never heard from anybody twice. Um, so right in the beginning, we ended up in Wapping, uh, which is right down by the river near the Tower of London. It's like the old historic Docklands, um, which, was, uh, which was really cool. Um, we liked it there, but um, after a year or so, we moved to uh, Islington. So we live in Highbury now. So I live uh, right near Arsenal Stadium. So when the games are on at the Emirates, I can hear it through the window. That's funny. I used to live on um, City Road, kind of not too far from Angel Station. Um, yep. when, I, when I was working in, in the city uh, and I could hear I could hear the stadium as well from there. Um, it's funny you said it is it is very controversial. People can get sort of very defensive of their neighborhoods and where they live. Um, and um, but it, I, I, like part of the adventure of living in London is can be moving around from different parts of it as well and, and noticing how seeing how, how different life is in different parts of it. When I first moved there it was in 1999 and I lived in Balham and I gather Balham is kind of upscale now, but it was not at that time. Uh, there was not, yeah. not there was no <laughs> coffee shop in Balham at the time. <laughs> there was no okay. Starbucks or anything like that. But so yeah, so well, that's really great. And so uh, and then and so then you worked for um, you worked for Yelp and you worked for Lyft. Um, and so were you in similar kind of roles there? Yeah, yeah. When I when I first moved, I, I kind of I still had a foot in the VFX industry. So I was working for um, this startup called Avere that did network storage, and we were a big customer of theirs. 
at Weta um, and uh, they needed somebody in, in Europe on the sort of technical sales side to go around. And so that was really fun. I did that for a couple of years and I got to go meet everybody in the VFX world in, in Europe. Um, um, but eventually I decided that I wanted to get um, back into people management. There was something about that that I, that I really missed. So, so I, I switched and uh, went to work for Yelp who had a kind of smaller engineering office. I mean, they're San Francisco based, um, but one of the, uh, I think the, the VP of engineering or the CTO or something was, was British and had this network of uh, British techs that he had worked with. And so he started up a, uh, an office uh, in, in London, which was really uh, kind of trying to solve this problem that we were just talking about in terms of like, how do you run a 24 seven website without sort of keeping people in? And it's like, well, London is eight hours away from San Francisco. So you park a team of sysadmins in London and now you have 16 hours of the day covered while people are you know, sitting in front of their screens. Um, you know, I guess the, the dream would always be maybe to put another team in Sydney or something and cover the, cover the third shift. But, um, but yeah, anyway, that was, that was the, the kind of idea. So even, you know, at that point when you were on call, you were really only expected to cover like 12 hours of the day instead of 24 hours. Somebody else would, uh, you know, in the other time zone would, would cover the other part. Um, so that was, that was kind of what the office uh, was, was sort of started for, but then once it was there, it became this magnet where we started building up different teams and uh, mostly on the infrastructure side, um, but all kinds of different, you know, database teams and streaming teams, all kinds of different things. Uh, and was it a similar at Lyft as well? Was that, would they, did they have, a, did they open up a London office partly for the time zone reasons? Yeah, no, not, a, not at all. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah, that's a completely different one. Yeah, Lyft okay. was, uh, Lyft was kind of completely based in, uh, based in San Francisco, but their, um, the self-driving division uh, was based in Silicon Valley in Palo Alto, and then they acquired a computer vision startup uh, in London. That was a, a small tech startup who was doing some really cool stuff with, uh, with mapping and computer vision. Um, and so they acquired them and uh, integrated them into level five. Okay. So that's how they ended up with a, with a London office. Yeah. Um, just before we move on to talk about your book uh, in the next part of the interview, I just wanted to ask you briefly, this has become uh, a little sort of thing we've been doing for almost two years now, unfortunately, but asking people, you know, how is the pandemic currently affecting them in their life and work? Um, and, you know, we interview, we get to interview people from all around the world and, you know, you're probably the fifth or sixth person in London in the last two years that we've interviewed. So if you wouldn't mind, what's it, what's it like for you now? Yeah, it's, it's okay. I mean, at the moment we're sort of right in the middle of the Omicron wave, I guess, where it just feels like everybody in London has it. Uh, I don't know how I haven't uh, gotten it. I mean, I, I'm, I'm pretty cautious. I'm much more cautious, I would say, <laughs> than maybe the average person. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm in a, I'm in a position where I'm able to do that. You know, it's, it's really a position of privilege these days. You know, if I worked at a supermarket or something, I wouldn't, you know, have these choices available to me. I'd have to go out into the community every day. And, uh, you know, I'm really aware that my wife works for the NHS and she works in a, in a lab and she's had to work, uh, you know, throughout the pandemic going in every day because she can't take her work home with her <laughs> it's obviously you know when you're working at a lab that's that's not available but yeah so I, I've been working from home you know we sent everybody home uh, I guess like everybody else in sort of March 2020 and uh, I didn't go back to the office uh, I think until August this year um, was my first time sort of setting foot in the uh, August of 2021 um, my first time sort of setting foot back in but we didn't really um uh, go back in. And now, of course, we're all uh, kind of strictly working from home again. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's been interesting. And, you know, we still have tons of friends and family back in New Zealand who we talk to regularly, who are just kind of living this completely different, different experience of the, uh, of the pandemic. And it feels like now that they have cases and everything else, it's like, we're, we're sort of, living in the future here and talking back to other people <laughs> like we know what's coming <laughs> watch out we know what it's going to be like um so yeah we've had you know i think a little bit more exposure to 
to that sort of side of things um, just through through family in New Zealand. One one thing I'm just curious about is um, are people wearing masks outside? No. Okay. No, not at all. It was never really a thing in London. Um, the government never mandated it, and so nobody's nobody's ever really picked up on that. Yeah, it's it's curious where I live um, on on Vancouver Island uh, in the city of Victoria. Uh, it it that never became really a thing here. Okay, occasionally when there's sort of like spikes of concern in the news, I've noticed that you know I might see a few people with a mask on outside. That's ha- definitely happening now a bit, but it never really became a kind of like the conventional the conventional thing to do here uh, either. No, thanks very much for sharing that. Um, uh, it's uh, un- unfortunately it's been yeah since March 2020. Uh, hopefully, I get to stop asking this question at some point. Um, yeah, I mean, one one of the things just to like you know s- start thinking about the about the book was the the sort of big push I had to like really kind of getting the core of it done because uh, I've been working on it for a few years now. Um, but was I, I took advantage, one of my uh, kind of ex-colleagues from Yelp, Flavian, um, who's a really good uh, Rust programmer and has always been super helpful and encouraging and, and everything else. I think in like May or June or something uh, last year, he moved to uh, Australia. And so he had to do a, uh, a two-week uh, quarantine in a, in a hotel in Australia. Uh, and so I took advantage of that, um, of, of crack the book and, and get the core of it done. Um, so I kind of said, well, you're going to be, you know, locked up in a, in a quarantine hotel for a couple of weeks. Do you want to help me review the book? So I took the time off work here and he was locked up in a quarantine hotel in Australia. And we just went back and forth across those time zones. Like he would review the book all day and I would wake up see all his notes, you know, fix everything up, address all his, you know, concerns and everything, and then leave him a bunch of stuff to do for the next day. And those uh, couple of weeks really, really were the most productive time I ever had over the whole three years of writing the book. Yeah, no, thanks. Thanks very much for that. Actually, that's, that's really interesting to hear about this sort of like, you know, uh, multi-hemisphere editing process that's going on. Uh, but <laughs> but um, uh, so yeah, so um, and, and thanks also for the segue into talking about the book, uh, Rust from the Ground Up. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, um, for anyone listening who might not know, uh, what the Rust programming is, programming language is, um, and maybe what it's primarily preferred to be used for in, in programming. Yeah. Um... So it's, it's sort of one of the newer programming languages, although I guess it's probably about 10 years old at this point. And it came out of Mozilla, so the company behind the Firefox browser. Uh, and they had some programming language you know, researchers on staff who were thinking about this kind of stuff. And uh, of course, Firefox is a big pile of uh, C++, um, which kind of inevitably leads to, you know, different kind of security problems or stability problems, you know, crashes. Uh, but I think, you know, their motivation was really around uh, security because of course the browser is kind of the way everyone connects to everything these days. So when you have a, you know, a hole in the browser, it kind of affects everything. So they developed this, this language. It's really designed for systems programming, which is kind of lower level programming uh, and really aimed at the market that C and C++ uh, are in uh, now. And so it's uh, it's kind of up and coming and, and really interesting. Uh, and, you know, over the course of my career in systems, I did have some, you know, gigs where I was kind of full-time programming, but often it's, it's sort of a mix. Um, of you, you sort of start dipping your toe into systems programming when you're running these systems because you say like, oh, there's, some bug in Apache or something like that. And nobody else has fixed it yet, but it's affecting me. So I'm just gonna like wade into the source code and try and figure it out. And so the first time you do it, it's maybe you fix like one line of code, you know, and you you sort of patch it, but then it goes from there and you start writing more and more and you say, oh, wow, it'd be great if we had a little tool that did this. And so I ended up, you know, writing um, some network monitoring tools uh, in C um, and eventually some NFS tools that we were using to monitor the, all the NFS storage at Weta. Um, so I wrote, I wrote those in C. 
Um, and eventually I had the idea, like I think with most kind of C programs, it was like, oh, it would be good if this was like multi-threaded. I think I was trying to do something where it could connect to like multiple servers at the same time. Um, and I said, I hear everybody's doing this kind of stuff in Rust now. So let me just rewrite this, this existing program that I wrote. I'll rewrite it from C into Rust. And so I waded into that and just realized I was way in over my, my head. Like Rust is a completely different beast. Um, and you get a lot from it. Um, like it gives you a ton of guarantees about, you know, the security and sort of quality of, of the code that you get out. But the learning curve is like super, super steep, um, especially coming from, from someone with like a C programming background. Uh, and so I just found myself like, gosh, I just have no idea what I'm doing. And, I, you know, here I have this like multi thousand line, you know, code base that I'm trying to trying to mess with. I said, let me let me start with something. Let me start with something simple. And I'd spend a whole bunch of my uh, sort of middle part of my career working with uh, the BSD systems, which are kind of somewhere between like Solaris was like the big commercial Unix that I started on. And then Linux is like the big sort of open source thing. But the BSDs are like another sort of evolutionary branch of, uh, of Unix. Uh, and I spent a lot of time in the free BSD and open BSD worlds. So I was pretty just, familiar with those. Just for people who might not know, that's the Berkeley software distribution. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So it goes back to the, back to the early eighties, um, Berkeley, some people at Berkeley, including like Bill Joy, who's the sort of famous programmer, um, started doing open source, uh, contributions on top of Unix. Um, and it kind of eventually became its own open source, uh, operating system. So, which are, they're still around FreeBSD and OpenBSD are, are still, you know, really, really going strong as, as an alternative to, to Linux. Um, and in fact, a lot of the early, like the Linux tools were kind of rewrites of the, of the BSD stuff in the, in the early days. And so I just had this idea of like, let me just start with like really, really simple programs. Like, let me write, so there's something, there's a program called CAT, which, um, kind of is short for concatenate. So it sort of glues files together. Um, although a lot of times people just use it just to, to read a file out. Um, but it's really, it's really simple. You know, it's like a hundred something lines of, of code. So um, at Yelp, we had uh, hackathons, I think three times a year um, where everybody would get basically three or four days to just hack. Um, we would put all like project work on, on pause um, and you could just do anything you wanted to do. So it didn't have to be work-related. It could be work-related. You could say there's this bug in some system that I'm not responsible for that I've always wanted to fix. And, you know, my manager would never give me time to do it. Um, but now I don't have to ask anybody's permission. I can just go and go and fix it. Or people would do kind of physical projects. There was a lot of people, you know, bringing in Raspberry Pis and kind of doing doing stuff like that. It was just a chance to like, of express yourself and I think I was spending all my time in meetings as a manager and not really doing any technical work so I used to love hackathons because it's like uh, there used to be a sofa that was like kind of designated as like my sofa that I would just like <laughs> sit on during hackathon I put my headphones on and I would just have my laptop and I would just code like I was in college right like you just code for like 10-12 hours a day um and that's how I started to, to teach myself Rust. And I, I took a lot of notes as I was going. I was, you know, I just had a, like a, a Google Doc or something. And just for my own benefit, I was just like, oh, wow, I just found this thing. Like, here's a sharp edge. Here's a thing. Like, I had to do some research to find this out. And I was just taking it. And at a certain point, I kind of thought like, oh, this might be an interesting kind of series of blog posts. And then through some conversations with some other people, at work, it was the kind of germ of like a book started kind of forming. And so I said, why don't, instead of a series of blog posts, why don't I, why don't I do a book? Uh, and so that's what, that's what, you know, the genesis of the book was. So the idea is that every chapter, um, I take a, a sort of Unix utility from the old BSD sources. Um, in fact, to keep things simple, I'm sometimes going back into the eighties uh, or early nineties um, just to, you know, uh, keep the, keep the sort of core program quite simple. 
they've all, all these programs have sort of grown in complexity over the years as people keep adding <laughs> features, um, but the original ones are usually quite simple. Um, and so I just do one, one per chapter. We just rewrite it from, from BSD's uh, C code into, into Rust. Um, and I'm teaching it as I go. Yeah, thanks very much for sharing that story. And so you're, you're, um, you're publishing it in progress, if I have that correct. Yeah, that's right. I mean, this is, this is how I found LeanPub. And I mean, I think I heard about it on, on Hacker News, which was great. It was like this sort of escape valve because I'd been working on it you know, for, for maybe a couple of years and sort of trying to, you know, get to the end. There's never really a point maybe at which you're, you're kind of done, but I sort of had this vision of like how many chapters I wanted to do and which programs I wanted to write and, and everything else. Um, but it was always like so far in the horizon, like it was really difficult to, to sort of stay motivated. Um, and uh, yeah, then I started hearing about stuff like MemePub where it's like, oh, I don't, I, like, I don't have to have the book finished. Um, I can do it as I go. So uh, I basically gone through, you know, the other thing is like, I'm teaching myself Rust. Like I wasn't a, a Rust programmer at the start of the book. I consider myself one now, although probably not the, you know, the best one ever, but um, you know, I've, I've obviously spent a couple of years staring at this stuff. So um, so I, I kind of wrote myself all the way through the book several times at this point, because I, you get to the end of the book and then you're like, wow, I know all this stuff now. Now I'm, I can go back to chapter one and you look at the stuff you wrote in chapter one and you're like, this is terrible. Like I didn't, I had no idea what I was doing. So you end up, you know, I've, I've rewritten the whole thing. I don't, I don't, I've lost track of, of how many times, because it's kind of this process of, you know, you write chapter one and then you write chapter two. And in the process of writing chapter two, you discover some things and then you go back and you rewrite chapter one. And then eventually you sort of finish that process and then you write chapter three. And then as you write chapter three, you learn some new stuff and you go back and you rewrite chapter one and chapter two. And then you do chapter four and you rewrite one, two, and three. <laughs> so every chapter sort of leads to this thing. Um, but yeah, so what I'm, so I have like a, the whole sort of book written I, I got to like 300 pages or something like that um, and then now what I'm doing is going back and editing and typesetting and everything uh, each chapter one at a time uh, and so I published the first three and I'm trying to finish uh, number four now um, yeah that's that's uh, uh, that's sort of very uh, gratifying to hear that you're using using leanpub that way uh, that's you know basically the reason leanpub exists is for books book projects like that um, you know originally um, uh, you know the idea of like why would you why would you rewrite a published chapter you know might have seemed you know unusual to people but you know if you're writing about an evolving technology but and more specifically something you're evolving on then of course you're going to you're going to rewrite an, an, an already published chapter to make it better or correct mistakes and things like that. And, and the, from, the, from the other side of it, from the reader's side, if someone else is learning Rust for the first time, they don't, they don't care if your chapter one is perfect. They, they desperately want that content. They want to they wanna get started and learn. Um, and then if, if they run into a problem that you fix in the chapter, they're, they're overjoyed that the, that the chapter they already read was edited and is there for them to, to read again. So that's- Yeah, that's, that's right. Really great to hear. Have you been have you been um, getting any feedback or soliciting feedback from readers? Uh, I haven't been soliciting feedback. Um, I've kind of soft launched it. I mean, this is definitely going to be the widest audience. I think that's that's sort of been exposed to it um, because it also just felt like again, like I don't have this sort of like when I when I published like the first. I think I published the first two chapters at once because the first one is pretty short, um, but it didn't feel like. I had anything really this huge thing to make like a big fanfare about, you know, I was like, Oh, let me get a few more done. And I'm sort of trickling out word uh, kind of as I go. So I do a little bit on Twitter now, but you know, nobody knows about the book. So they're not really following me on Twitter yet. Um, and I meant, I sort of mentioned it sometimes on hacker news, but I haven't done like a big show hacker news. Cause it doesn't feel like I have, you know, I'll, I'll sort of save that for maybe when more of the book is is complete, if not the whole thing, but you know maybe maybe at least get over halfway or something. And so stuff is is kind of trickling in, but it was actually really good. Um, uh, you know, just 
I wasn't really planning on announcing anything, but somebody on Hacker News asked uh, asked a question like, hey, is anybody writing a book that teaches systems programming by doing one program at a time or something like, it was like exactly what I'm doing. And so I was like, all right, here we go. So I wrote a comment and said, yeah, it's up on LeanPub. Uh, here it is. Uh, and I think I got about my first 10 sales out of that. Uh, and then one of the people that bought it sent me this really detailed email basically with all the things that I had gotten wrong. <laughs> and and it, it sort of took me a little, you know, a day or something to sort of absorb that, right? And, you know, to be honest, I think, uh, like, you know, with most people, it, it's hard to sort of put your, your sort of project and your baby out there in the world because you know that, you know, the, the sort of negative, you know, stuff is going to come in. And I think that was partially behind my motivation to get a lot of it done because I sort of thought if I, if, if I published it like literally as I was writing each chapter without having, you know, more of the book done ahead of me and I got a whole bunch of negative feedback, it might be so demotivating that I would just give up. So I was like, I want to kind of get the thing done and then put it out there. And then if people say stuff, it's like, well, it's already done. I just need to tweak it, you know, and I can, I can sort of power through, but somebody, you know, sent me really detailed notes uh, and so when I went to publish the next chapter, I, I wrote back to him and I said, you know, I've incorporated, you know, the, the changes that you suggested. Could I send you the next chapter before I publish it and have you copy edit it? Um, and he really kindly agreed to do that. So I kind of found an editor just organically through this process because I wasn't planning on on hiring an editor or anything. Um, but I really have. Um, yeah, this person, Dan Wilhelm, who's doing a great job. Um, I'm trying to be like really respectful of his time and, you know, not, you know, it's, he's not a full-time editor or anything, but he just provides this like really direct and great feedback um, that's really improving the quality. So I really appreciate it, but it's great how this all happened just through the kind of community around us. That's a really great story that, um, that reminds me of a very kind of, um, old kind of lean pub myth, myth kind of story from a long time ago. It's, it's a true story, but or legend, I guess I should say, but years and years ago, um, someone published a book on lean pub and then discovered someone had translated it into Russian and basically published it okay. on their own. Uh, and instead of getting mad, the author contacted their trans, their, you know, independent, unofficial, the, independently translator, appointed yeah. translator and said, Hey, uh, why don't, you just why don't you translate my next book and we'll share the revenue from from the translation and and the person of course agreed agreed to that um, and became an official translator <laughs> as opposed to oh, wow. a kind of pirate translator and, and and I mean that's just you know it's sort of it's, it is it is amazing how people can can come together on projects like this um, the the person's motivation wasn't to steal it was to have a Russian version out there for people to read in Russian because they they liked the book and thought it was important that people be able to know it and perhaps was just too shy to reach out or something like that and and so. So, um, uh, you know, it is, it is just amazing how, how people can come together around projects like this, even, even sometimes, you know, when it's totally unexpected. Uh, the last question I always ask people on the podcast, if they're using LeanPub, uh, is if there was one feature we could build for you, or if there was one really annoying thing about LeanPub that we could fix for you, can you think of anything you would ask us to do uh, other, other than improve Google search? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, that's that's definitely out of out of your control. Yeah. And yeah. in the uh, yeah. in the in the sort of uh, big uh, big machine over there. Um, I'm trying to think. Has there been anything so far that I've that I've kind of run into? Um, I guess. Uh, as I do, maybe the stats are there somewhere. And so maybe this is just going to turn into a sort of tech support call. Um, but as I publish new chapters, um, it's not really clear to me how many of like the original kind of folk are downloading those. Um, you know, so as I, as I go, you know, you, it's, it's really great. You get these emails, you know, especially like in the middle of the night, you sort of get an email like, Hey, somebody bought your book. Um, you know, which is, is just really super gratifying. Um, and then you, you sort of publish a, a fresh chapter and I, I guess all the existing people get an email saying like, Hey, there's an updated, there's an updated version of the book. Um, but you don't get that sort of gratifying thing of like, oh, hey, all these people that already bought the book just like downloaded the, you know, downloaded the new chapter. 
um, you just kind of get that initial that initial hit of adrenaline when they when they first buy it. Yeah, thanks so much for sharing that. Actually, I mean, I, by the way, if these we save this for this this part of the conversation for the very end because sometimes it that's does what I guess. Yeah, yeah, because sometimes it does turn into technical support, which is great from from our perspective. Um, and there actually are people who skip the first parts of the interview and skip go to the end where it's like all about writing and publishing and stuff like that. And um, but one of the reasons, you know, if if you find a feature on LeanPub that works, it's it's probably there because some author asked for it at some yeah. point. <laughs> and 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 when when I say if it works, that maybe because an author found some problem, technical problem with it or something like that. And you know, so we've we've been kind of blessed that you know a lot of our authors are actually programmers themselves. So they're people who are used to finding, reporting and fixing, fixing problems. Um, we do have uh, with respect to what you're talking about, that's really interesting that uh, we don't we yeah, what we don't do is sort of give you the kind of dopamine hit of someone's downloaded your book. We do, we do, you can, you can toggle on and off, email me and notify me. Uh, But we do have a page called download formats that does give you some statistics about like which, you know, how many people have downloaded the PDF or not how many, what proportion have downloaded PDF, EPUB and Mobi and stuff like that. Uh, But that would actually be- Yeah, that's what I found, but I I have a hundred percent. I only publish a PDF at this point. Oh, right, of course. Yeah, yeah. So that's not useful. Um, Yeah, yeah. I'll I'll think about that because that that is that, that, I mean, one of the reasons we, Bean Pub's in this in progress publishing business is that like, is for motivation. Um, you know, is that, you know, you get, get your book out there early, start getting sales, things like that. And um, yeah, letting, letting people know, you know, oh, this, this, you know, now all of a sudden a hundred people have downloaded it or something like that. Uh, That would actually be really sort of like really good for authors to be able to get that gratification or to know if no one's downloading it. And, you know, is there something else I can do about my messaging or something like that? So that's, that's a really great suggestion. I'll make sure to note that for the team. Well, uh, Matt, thanks very much for sharing so much of your, of your, your story with us today. Uh, and yeah, not for, at all. And, and also the story of, of how you're writing your book uh, and best of luck with the project. And yeah, thanks very much for being on the Front Matter podcast. Okay. Anytime. Thanks so much for building LeanPub. Thanks. And as always, thanks to all of you for listening to this episode of the Front Matter Podcast. If you like what you heard, please rate and review it wherever you found it. And if you'd like to be a LeanPub author yourself, please check out our website at leanpub.com. Thanks.